Uh, here's the first question from uh, Buck Rice, who says, why can't we divide by zero? <laughs> why? I, I, I love that. That's a great question. I've carried that with me my whole life. Right. Because the answer is, well, it's undefined. And so my, my response is, well, well define, define it. Define it. Define right. It. <laughs> Get off your duff and define it. Yeah, exactly. Define it. And you know who does? Uh, the mathematicians, actually. There are parts of math, um, one particular called projective geometry, where uh, one of the objects in there is essentially what we want to get at by the idea of one divided by zero. And the thought is, if you have a number line and you walk infinitely far either to the left or to the right, there's this unified point that you're approaching called the point at infinity. Um, and you can do useful math by, by defining that. And it, that's kind of what you're getting at when you have this notion of one divided by zero. But if you're not doing that and you want to say, like, why isn't it defined? I mean, it depends on what you're doing with division, right? If, if what you want to say with division is like, I have, you know, I have one cupcake and I'm dividing it among three people. How many does each of them get? And you're like a third of a cupcake. If I have one cupcake and I'm dividing among zero people, it's like, an, it's an incoherent question. Like the cupcake's got to go somewhere. The fact that that question is incoherent is maybe what we mean by saying that it's undefined. See, but that's, that's my point. In practical terms, I have one cupcake and I want to divide it between zero people. We got to go back to the beginning of the statement. I have one <laughs> cupcake. Okay? That's the answer. And that's the, the answer. The answer, Chuck eats the, the cupcake. The answer is I eat the cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> now it's defined. Now it's defined. All right. This is Kira. Uh, actually, I'm going to combine two questions in one because Kira and Gavin Bamber actually are similar, but I'm going to read both their questions successively so you can answer them. Okay. Hi, this is Kira from Georgia in the U.S. Uh, in your opinion, what is the most fascinating unsolved mathematical problem in cosmology that, if understood, could fundamentally change how we view the universe? Hold that. Gavin Bamber says, hey, Gavin here from North Vancouver. Uh, please visit, Neil. Uh, what's your favorite unsolved math question, and how would you illustrate it? So, one, uh, fundamentally change the way we view the universe, and then part B, what is your personal uh, favorite unsolved question? Wait, wait, you question? can't say one and then part B. It's either one and two or <laughs> A and B. No, see, what I am doing is a new kind of math. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, I'm going to punt off part one to Neil here because um, I, I'll have some humility here. I'm not sure what the most important uh, mathematical problems of cosmology are. I'm not much of a cosmology person, so I'm curious what you say. We have singularity problems in the universe. Right. What All of our equations tell us that at the center of a black hole, nature is dividing by zero. Right. Okay? Everything goes, the denominator goes to zero, right? what happens to the value, the of, the value of everything okay. else? We say well, there's infinite density and infinite this, and that doesn't even make any sense. No, it doesn't. So what we don't know, but we suspect, is that that's a limit to the application of our theory of the universe, not a limit to the invocation of the math. Right. Because we're not the first to blame the math. I'm just saying. Gotcha. Because math is badass, and we're not, okay? Uh, so we're gonna take the blame first, but, it is true that certain discoveries in math have led the discoveries in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. We had no need for non-Euclidean geometry until we did. And so this is the, the curvature of space-time. It's not flat, and Euclidean geometry is flat. And, and, and who, who came up with curved geometry? So Riemann is the big one there. So, so Riemann, and when was that? Like 1800s sometime? Yeah, it was in the 1800s, um, like maybe 50s, let's say. Okay, all right, so 19th century, uh, we have the tools to think about uh, curved Curve geometry. Speed, right. That was immediately uptook by uh, the cosmologists right. to think about what could be the geometry of the universe. Right. And you needed a way to talk about it. So that's all I got here, but it's, it's, well, it's the good. math leading us, not us finding a math problem that's yeah. not solved. Well, I mean, you bring up Riemann talking about non-Riemannian geometry, but he's also the source of how I was going to answer the, the part B of that question oh. for one of my favorite unsolved problems. There's part one and then part B. Yes, yeah. part one and part B. So Riemann, um, you know, he, he, he did a lot of geometry stuff. He also was one of the fathers for complex analysis, basically using complex numbers um, to solve other problems within math. And he had one paper on number theory so that's the, I described prime numbers earlier, like this twin prime conjecture. 
Um, he has this one paper that he puts out, I think it's 1857, um, about prime numbers. Otherwise, he doesn't do any number theory. And it completely changed the whole field because he basically said, hey, here's this continuous function. It doesn't feel like it's about primes that are all discrete. It's very like continuous. It's got complex numbers. That makes it very different. And if you understand this function, you completely understand the primes. Um, these days, we call it the Riemann zeta function because he used the Greek letter zeta. Um, and, he, and he basically said, hey, we can really, really well understand how the primes are distributed um, if we understand something about this function. And he put this conjecture up about where all the, if you want to solve when this function equals zero, he didn't know how to solve it. He had a guess for where those solutions are. And this is called the Riemann hypothesis. He was hypothesizing it. It's one of those million dollar problems. And it clearly, it's a very, very beautiful question because it's kind of asking like if the prime numbers form a chord in a certain sense, because it studies them based on frequency information. And nobody knows how to answer it, but the more you dig into this question, it paints a really, really beautiful picture. Is that your favorite unsolved problem? I think it's my favorite, yeah. Ooh, I think oh, it, wow. I yeah. think. Okay. It sounded like it was, too. You make it sound <laughs> very elegant as a... <laughs> but he sounded a little a bit problem. excited as yes, he was talking about I it. I love it, yeah, <laughs> okay. Thank you.